Yeah, so hey y'all, nice to meet you all. I'm Eric, um, engineer on the protocol team at Uniswap. Um, here to talk about Uniswap X. So Uniswap, you know, it's we're a very like dApp driven, you know, protocol. Um, don't really work that much at the interop layer or infrastructure layer. But I think, you know, I'll talk about Uniswap X, like one of our newest products. And I think there'll be some really cool things to talk about in terms of like interoperability, especially within the realm of like what does it mean to be, you know, to make a swap? Like, what kind of swap parameters can we choose, and um, uh, how can we extend this to like a cross-chain or multi-chain um, world? So, yeah, I think first I'll just go through what we have today, and I'll go through the current version of Uniswap X we have, and then I'll deep dive into cross-chain Uniswap X. Um, so we all know classic Uniswap. Um, you swap against the AMM, right? You generate some form of call data. It's like, I want to go through this pool and I want this amount out. Very concrete, very simple. Um, uh, we designed this and one of the benefits is that it's like always up. Um, uh, you just interact with the protocol. Um, it's kind of evergreen like that. The con is that right now you can only access V2 and V3 liquidity. Um, those are the two versions that we have currently. And um, uh, the reality is that, especially on some L2s, like Uniswap is not the majority liquidity holder, um, especially on L2s where we didn't launch um, initially or on other L1s. Um, uh, and there's no ability to recapture MEV. And you know, this is asterisk by um, assuming you're just sending it to the public mempool. Um, of course, if you use something like MEV blocker or MEV share, like there's other opportunities there. But for the sake of um, simplicity, let's just assume that. So. Um, this is where Uniswap X comes in. So the main driver for Uniswap X is we want to give users more liquidity and better execution. Um, and so very high overview of Uniswap X. Um, it's an intent-based protocol, so users are signing off on some swap conditions that must be met for the order to be filled. This is very similar to how on a Uniswap swap today, um, or like a classic swap is what we'll call it, you're, the, the user signs off on what pools the swap has to go through and how much do they have to get out. And Uniswap X, for us, like it, it unlocks off-chain liquidity and other on-chain sources. Um, and because Uniswap X isn't specifying a specific route or pools, um, any filler can kind of say, okay, like I'll take some liquidity from V3, I'll take some liquidity from V2, but I'll also use some of my own liquidity, right? Or I'll use some private liquidity that I've hedged on uh, a sex somewhere. And uh, essentially for Uniswap, this outsources the routing problem. So what is this problem? Um, uh, basically, you know, we're working on v4 right now. Um, and one of the ideas that we have is that with v4, there's going to be a huge proliferation of pools um, with addition of hooks. Like now hooks are not unique on token and fee combination like they are today in v3. They're unique on tokens, fees, and hooks. Um, and so theoretically, there's an infinite number of hooks. And uh, you know, as Uniswap Labs, like we're managing our own routing infrastructure and, our, and like our own interface, and it's pretty difficult for us to, you know, if we have to filter through everything. Um, and so we designed Uniswap X to offload some of this complexity onto the existing sophisticated filler slash searcher network um, in Ethereum. So going through the actual swap lifecycle of Uniswap X, um, uh, users still request quotes. Um, we essentially parameterize the order, um, and this is very vague, and I'll go into it more. But at the core of the current version of Uniswap X, it's Dutch auction based. Um, and so like a Dutch auction is just, you know, um, a different, it's just like an opposite of an English option, um, auction, excuse me. We just start at a higher level and then we go down. Um, uh, and uh, the idea is that as the order decays over time on chain, it becomes more profitable to fill. And uh, we have a public filler network, which is you know, um, competitive, and they try and fill the order before it decays past um, the bottom limit. And at the end, the swapper receives their output tokens. So there's a lot of ambiguity in each of these steps, and I'll kind of talk through um, uh, current issues and problems that you know, we have at each stage. So one of the problems right now is that it's very difficult to parameterize this auction. Um, uh, because it's a Dutch auction, we need to figure out what price to start the order at and what price to end the order at. And uh, it's easy to, to figure out the end amount. 
that's like very synonymous with the current concept of slippage. Um, we just have some like min amount out that the user sets, but how do we figure out what number or like what start amount to give the user? Um, uh, if we set it too high, we get really high latency. Like if the start amount for the auction is like, you know, like a thousand bips above the fair market price, and the user's gonna be waiting for a few blocks before the order fills. If it's too low, then we don't give the user a chance for price improvement, which is um, one of the core goals of the protocol is better execution. And so there's a few options of doing this. Um, um, one of them is a very simplistic method. It's like, hey, let's just take the AMM price. Um, we'll add some buffer to it. And then uh, you know we'll just decay from that elevated price down to the user's minimum amount out. Um, uh, and uh, it's very simple to understand. And uh, the risk inherently with it is that um, again, if we set the price too high, it's bad latency. Um, I think like Uniswap, we really care about user UX, and we don't want users to be waiting around for like ten blocks, you know, like five minutes for an order to be filled. And so we try to keep orders to like a relatively short life cycle. That also helps prevent like price risk and price movement and failed orders from um, slippage. And one of the problems is that if we start the price too low, it's just bad for the swapper because it's worse execution. Another option is to use an RFQ system. And so imagine at the time when the order is quoted, we run a simple RFQ auction across some set of fillers to determine the starting price. Um, this is kind of just like a one way to get a read on like a fair market price for the swap. And uh, the benefit of that is that if it's accurate, um, we get really good latency and we get really good execution. However, like because we're like publicizing some order flow and you know this is a at a very critical step of the process, which is quote time. Um, we need to prevent two things, like snooping on order flow. Um, so this is like adversarial selection between fillers in the space. Um, and we also need to prevent griefing with bad quotes. Um, as you can imagine, like if there's a rogue kind of filler who is quoting incorrectly, um, it'll basically impact the whole system because we're using this to um, uh, give swappers safe criteria for an order. So our goal at Uniswap, right, is always to further decentralize things. And um, right now, anybody can fill orders on X. It's a totally open, permissionless market. Um, but we want to make the system even more permissionless. So in terms of the concept that I brought up before about that RFQ system, um, something like an automated reputation system would help with that. So what I mean is that um, a system uh, that punishes the bad behavior of like sitting on stale quotes or like snooping for quotes or trying to adverse select you know other people in the space. Um, uh, very hard problem to solve. We're definitely working on it. You know, it's a it's a problem that um, uh, is not new to the space, right? Solving like kind of enforcing good behavior and um, uh, these like consensus like designs. And so, yeah, um, definitely stay tuned for that. Also, um, uh, one thing that we've touched on today a lot is just like mainnet is not ideal, right? Like mainnet is expensive, 12 seconds per block. Um, uh, let's say we want a swap to happen in like a minute, that gives us five blocks of decay. And so the way that we run the on-chain auction is that every block that happens, we have some resolved amount along like a decay curve. And if you only get five blocks, um, uh, that's not that much, right? So it's very, it's not very granular. Um, and uh, you know, the real price of the swap or the fair market price is very likely between two ticks or two blocks. And so this leads us to have like a little bit worse execution. And so this is just a diagram to show kind of what that looks like. Um, uh, yeah, and so the current decay on chain is more of like a stepwise function. Um, ideally, it becomes linear, um, uh, and there's a lot of ways to solve this. One way is very naive, right? Let's just go on on like an L2. Um, so for optimism, two second block times about, we get six times more granularity, um, and hopefully that results in much better execution because each tick where the order can be filled is much closer to fair market price. And especially because with Uniswap X, we're trying to unlock um, PMM liquidity, so private market maker liquidity, and like sex liquidity. Um, uh, this makes so just, like just makes sense because you know we want to give more granularity and kind of match the off-chain trading experience. 
All right, so Uniswap has a lot of protocols, right? We have v4 coming out. Um, uh, the one thing that we don't have is cross-chain swapping. Um, uh, we have multi-chain stuff. We have um, Uniswap X now, which so, so Uniswap X gave us more interoperability and more um, uh, customization on how an order can be filled. But you know, what if we get some more interoperability on what kinds of um, networks and chains can be swapped between? So cross-chain X, yeah, even more liquidity and even better execution. Right, so why cross-chain? Um, uh, we, a lot of protocols right now do like cross-chain messaging, cross-chain like swap and then bridge, bridge swap, you know, there, there's even atomic swaps too. Um, uh, we definitely wanna keep atomic swaps and uh, our idea right now is that we use cross-chain Uniswap X as an intent-based abstraction over bridges. Um, uh, the main bet is on proliferation of L2s and app chains and rollups, um, which I think we can all agree is very likely going to happen. And uh, so, so like, what do I mean about um, abstraction over bridges? Um, at a high level, a cross-chain Uniswap X order also, like, it still has some input amounts, some output amounts, um, uh, but users sign over this method of, of settling or method of bridging. Um, uh, and uh, so, like, for example, like, a user can submit a swap that's like, I want to trade 100 um, DAI on mainnet for, like, you know, 100 DAI on um, optimism. And they can say, I am only okay with this swap being filled through the optimism native bridge. Um, uh, and uh, that's like a concrete order specification. And um, one of the ideas is that we allow for, we don't allow for fillers and swappers to decide on fair market prices for a set of um, specs. And so let's say the user was also okay with like the wormhole bridge or some other bridges, right? Like then uh, we would expect that fair market price of that swap to change. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, this point about the filler bond um, is related to kind of one of our main goals, which is optimistic fills. Um, we don't want users to be waiting around like seven days, you know, for um, the fault period to pass. And so, um, uh, yeah, that's like one of the main goals. So for optimistic fills, again, it's very important for user experience. Um, uh, we only release the user's funds after this idea of like a challenge period has passed. And so, all orders have like um, a challenge period and then like a fill deadline. Um, uh, and uh, this is also one of the um, uh, one of the important things or like, parts of an order that should be priced in by a filler. And so on the previous page when I was talking about allowing for orders to, um, or sorry, allowing for fillers and swappers to decide on like fair market prices for orders. Like if a, like if a user was like, I want to make this crossing swap, but like I only give like, you know, um, uh, 10 seconds for you to fill it, right? Like that's like, that's not a very valuable order for a filler and we expect the market to kind of reflect that. Um, uh, and uh, obviously for, to enable optimistic fills, um, challenges are very important. And um, so anybody can challenge. Um, uh, the, the sad part about a challenge is that if, if an order is challenged, then we have to wait for the slow path or the message to be passed across the bridge fully. Um, so yeah, this is just a very um, a high level diagram of the happy path for uh, optimistic cross chain fill. Um, uh, so you see like we, we really don't like waiting for the, the bridge like passing time. Um, uh, and so we're gonna really try and optimize to make the optimistic path work. And then this is the unhappy case. Um, it's just essentially the, there is no fill on the output chain. There's a challenge and then the filler loses their bond. Um, uh, so this is referencing a previous slide of talking about how cross-chain X tries to be an abstraction over bridges. Um, uh, there's no like inherent bridge baked into the protocol, right? Um, and so when a swapper makes their own order, they kind of choose a bridge via choosing how the order can be filled. And they also choose the different parameters like, like we talked about, like the fill deadline, challenge deadline. And then um, it's up to fillers to kind of determine you know, like at what point am I willing to fill this order? Um, and I think this is like a really great improvement and just like it allows us to expand just like in, like interoperability around what protocols we can support without tying ourselves into a single message passing bridge or native bridge, et cetera. 
Sweet. So, um, uh, yeah, touched on this briefly, but you know we can design the system all we want, but the hardest part is making sure that the orders get filled. Um, we don't want like hanging orders. We don't want that seven day um, optimistic, like unhappy path case. That's like such bad UX. And so how can we tweak some parts of the order to make that not happen? Um, uh, so yeah, you said that. Um, uh, it's in the works, basically, is the short answer. Um, we've done a ton of experiments for the current version of, of Uniswap X to try and um, make it as best UX-wise as possible. And so this is one of our like um, top priority goals for Crosschain X. But yeah, that was a whole lot of detail about um, Uniswap X and Crosschain X, but just happy to answer any questions um, uh, by anybody, yeah. Thank you.